Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Petapixel Podcast. My name is Jaron Schneider, and I'm joined by my friend Chris Nichols. Hi. And also my friend Christy Odom, who's here to talk about underwater photography. And I have a message from Jordan, and I'm going <laughs> to read it exactly as he as he wrote it in our script here. Unfortunately for my fellow co-host and three fans, I'm home with a sick kid today. That's a bummer, as I'm a huge fan of Christy's work and was looking forward to the conversation. Also, this will prevent me from annoying Chris by asking him and Jaron to define their personality in some arbitrary yes, way. Finally. <laughs> so please, Jaron, ask Chris if he was a Disney princess, which princess oh, would he be? Son you of and a... Christy should, of course, answer as well, but only if we want to. Chris, you actually have to answer, apparently. Oh, no, everybody. Oh, wait. Okay. Well, I guess to honor Jordan for not being here, let's, let's do it. What Disney princess? I mean... <laughs> My first mindset would be Sleeping Beauty because I'm tired all the time. But uh, I would go with, I would I would go with Rapunzel, and I'll tell you why. Not just the hair, you know, although that is what makes us famous, but also, you know, she grew up in a single mother home. I did too, you know, basically only child. Have to entertain yourself, but at the same time, I feel like when Rapunzel gets together with other people, she's very gregarious and she's very like animated and she loves being around people, but then she can still spend time by herself and be alone. Also, you know, she's brave and she's, you know, she wins in the end. So, Rapunzel, that's what I'm going with. Christy, Jordan asked these questions because he wants people to better know who we are. Um, maybe you can, you can tell people who you are first, you can introduce <laughs> yourself and then explain what princess you are. Oh my goodness. Well, my name is Christy Odom. I'm a Nikon ambassador. I'm an associate fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers. And I try to use my photography and my video to celebrate the planet and give people, um, give wildlife the voice that they need. There's so much changing in our planet. I like being able to use photography to make a difference and make a change. And I call myself a, a conservation photographer. So photojournalist and telling nature's story. That's a little bit about me. <laughs> I don't even know what Disney princess I would be though. I have no clue. <laughs> it's like one of my favorites is the, I totally forgot her name, but the woman from brave with the like red curly hair. That yeah. Oh, you could Merida. just say the princess from brave. That's fine. <laughs> I love her, but I think we should be answering this question because Jordan's not here of what Disney princess we think he would be. <laughs> oh, oh man. Um, yeah, I don't know. Which one is full of anxiety? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not super familiar with Disney. I don't watch a lot of Disney things, but I watched Mulan as a child. So I think I would be Mulan. Um, I mean, cause you know, uh, oh, Chinese and dude. Yeah, warrior. I have no idea. I but have I have no idea, idea for Jordan either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, of note, Which, Chris, Chris, Christy, can you, what princess would you be? P appease Jordan. It would be the, the woman from Brave. Oh, that's right, Brave. Oh, Sorry. Yes. My brain my brain froze because I was trying to remember which uh, which one I would think uh, Jordan would be. At any rate, <laughs> Christy's here today to talk to us about some of her spectacular underwater photography and how she does it. Um, that like none of us really have any idea how she was able to capture some of these images. We'll do our best to describe them to you. But anyone who's listened to the audio only podcast should go to the story that we publish on Petapixel to see some yes. of the pictures, or you can watch the YouTube video later if you want. But uh, we're also going to cover our regular news stories. We have some Ni uh, Nikon news about maybe some Nikon in space. We got a new Z8 firmware. And then Canon and Sony are back at it. Each of them saying <laughs> they're the number one manufacturer of mirrorless cameras in the United States. Uh, so we're, we'll dig into that, but, uh, yeah, they're both but, pretty. <laughs> we're, we're all winners here. <laughs> Everybody right, gets a badge. <laughs> let's get to it.
All right, we're excited to get to the show, but as usual, we'd like to thank our sponsor here for the podcast, Petapixel. It's OM System. They've just unveiled their latest flagship camera on January 30th, the OM1 Mark II. I got to play with it. Very nice. It's building upon the legacy of the original OM1. Uh, it's got double the buffer size, impressive high-speed sequential shooting capabilities, up to 50 frames per second with continuous autofocus. What I really appreciated, though, the new camera offers enhanced autofocus and performance, accuracy, and reliability. It goes beyond their subject detection. The tracking works far more effectively now that really made me happy still the same rugged body same great design it's anticipated to begin shipping in a couple weeks insider information from om system revealed that they've extended their pre-order promotion originally expected to conclude on february 26th but it's now extended until the end of march so if you pre-order your om1 mark ii body or kit by march 31st now uh, you get to enjoy an additional complimentary blx1 battery which is always handy to have so bundle your purchase with select lenses save up even more money up to $300, visit explore.omsystem.com slash petapixel for all the details. You know, it's actually, uh, even though Christy mentioned she's a, is a Nikon ambassador, um, taking pictures of wildlife <clears throat> can be done with any camera. Mm. And I think actually the OM system, uh, the OM1 yeah, and the OM1 Mark II are fantastic wildlife Very popular cameras. for yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're not going full frame, the OM system is <laughs> pretty good for that. All right. Not going to put Christy in the awkward position of talking about a different camera manufacturer, so I will not, not ask for her input. <laughs> you still haven't told us what princess you are, though, Jaron. I, I did. Wants I said Mulan. Her. Did you? When did you say Mulan? I really, I snuck it in there. Yeah, I was very oh. distracting. You were probably thinking about what Princess Jordan would be when I said I would probably be Mulan. Oh, you know, yeah, I did she's not hear a, that She's Chinese all. and a warrior, and you know, she's the. I mean, she's probably the best princess overall. Like, awesome. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely the best. But yeah. You know, but, that, that serves as a perfect transition to talk about <laughs> NASA going mirrorless. Yeah. Uh, they have finally transitioned from DSLRs and they accepted a giant order of 13 Nikon Z9 cameras, 15 FTZ2 adapters, and more than 15 Nikkor Z lenses, including super wow. telephoto and macro lenses. Those were launched to the ISS in January. And uh, those are going to be replacing the DSLRs that they've been using for a really yeah. long time. Like D6 and D5 have been in service above Earth since like 2017. So um, we the knew photos of the astronauts are like they're stunningly beautiful. It was really nice. You know, what's interesting about this. You're like, well, it's not that big a station. Why do they need so many cameras? I, I mean, I understand that there's like cosmic radiation. I didn't know that it was so harsh on sensors, um, not to mention, you know, like the actual human beings that are up there. <laughs> but apparently like the radiation damages the sensors over time. Like six so the months. cameras. Yeah. yeah they, it like limits their shelf life, which is crazy. So I, I don't know. I guess they keep them shielded. And then when they break them out, they, they start to, I don't know. It's, it's wild. So uh, I'd be curious to hear more about that. But it's, uh, it's about time, right? About time. Any input, Christy? I'm just excited. It was really interesting talking to some of the um, photo engineers over at Nat Geo because I think that they've been in conversations with Nikon, just kind of helping engineer and helping things come along. And it's 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 exciting. It's really exciting, and I can't wait to see more Nikon photos from space. <laughs> yeah, these pictures are going to have a lot more resolution than they used to. Yeah, uh, they were working with a significantly less. Um, of note, if anyone, I put a link in the in the description below um, about the how Nikon cameras have special firmware and some more information about like the degradation of those sensors. I don't know if they take those cameras that have like busted sensors and put them on the ship back to Earth, replace the sensor, and ship the camera back, or if the camera is just straight up donezo and they just have to I send them new ones. They probably they probably sell them as collectibles for lots of money. I like to think they reuse them. Like, well, you know, to sponsor future space programs. No, no, course, I get it. Right? No, I see where you're coming but, from. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah, it's weird. I mean, I, I, I certainly I could see like, you know, you look at the shots, of course, the cameras are shielded because they're being exposed to, you know, the 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 vacuum of space. But also, of course, yeah, outside the station, of the radiation would be quite, quite intense. So, yeah, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. They've got these big white cases around them. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, well, we'll talk a little bit more about Nikon. I'm going to pop my chair down a little bit. There we go. Uh, Nikon also released the first major firmware update for the Z8, or as Chris would call it, the Z8. 
Yeah, uh, me and, and an entire other country plus like another the country across the ocean. Um, yeah, plus any of the colonies that that said country also created. Except- but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm the weird one for saying Zed. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Christy, you, uh, before we started recording, were expressing some excitement about this firmware. Why don't you uh, tell people what uh, what they should be stoked on? I'm really excited about it. And I'm excited to talk with you two about it because when we, we did that Z8 campaign and it was, it, it was a lot of fun to be one of the first with that camera playing around at Yellowstone. Um, yeah. Some of these features that they have in the firmware update, they've had on the Z9 for a little while. And I'm just so excited it's on the 8 because the auto capture like blows my mind. It is for a wildlife photography, being able to set up your camera as a camera trap and you can set up all your autofocus and exactly how you like the camera and you can tell it, hey, if an animal comes to this area, like I know with the 9, I haven't done it with the 8 yet, but with the 9, I put the plinna on the 9 and I had it Mm. um, at 1.8 targeting an area above a bird feeder and this hummingbird, it was, it was shooting. I was drinking coffee and it was taking these pictures of this hummingbird (laughs) at 1.8 because it also has the bird tracking. So that bird tracking is phenomenal. And it was getting these 1.8, like, crazy beautiful background shots and focus of the hummingbird in flight. And I was going, Oh my gosh, this is imagine what I'm going to be able to do with this with my pica work. I'm so excited. And then um, that bird tracking, I started to notice that it even worked on, on bees. And I'm talking about like four to five, like millimeter bees, like these tiny bees, because um, yeah, I was doing a project in in Bolivia on native bees and the, the uh, firmware update with the bird tracking for some reason worked with these little tiny bees in flight. And I'm, I ended up recording the EV footage because I'm going, no one's going to believe this, (laughs) but it is good. It's a good update. So I'm really excited for people with the eight, because I know a lot of birders too love the Z8. Now having that bird tracking is it's going to be fun. You all are going to like it. And I want to see what comes out with the camera trap stuff that people do with wildlife. Like it, 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 it's got a whole bunch of customization. So it does take a little bit of time to kind of make sure you learn your customizations. Like I definitely practiced on my dog and um, yeah. And that takes, it's got a learning curve to it, but once you get that down, it's, it's amazing what it can do. Now I haven't played with the auto capture feature at all. Uh, we do have a Z8. We don't have a Z9, right? I don't have a Z9 access to it right now. But um, how do you power the camera when you're when you set it up so that you can just leave it out there? You can easily attach it to a power bank, and you'll get that little extra okay. battery. But you can also do things with the camera to minimize the amount of battery it's using. Like you can turn off response time. You can, you know. But you, you, there's certain things that you can do to maximize. But if you got a powerful enough power bank, bank you connect to that with your Just HDMI. Leave it out for hours. I mean. Or if you, I mean, if you, if you have access to plug it in, like, Days? You can easily, <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. Wow. I know when I was doing like real long-term um, mushroom growing for time lapses, I was plugging in my cameras so that they would go for, you know, over a yeah. day of shooting. So there's, there's different ways to power it for extended periods of time. That was with my, my Z9. So, so I, yeah. I mean, I'd be curious to see these hummingbird pictures, by the way. Yeah, I, for sure. I'm with you on wondering what people like wildlife specifically are going to do with the auto capture. Um, you should show us what people can do with the <laughs> auto capture. I think I'd like to share that. I This comes up, anyone listening, this comes up constantly. Anytime I talk to Christy, like she mentions just offhandedly something absolutely awesome she did with a camera. And I'm just like, why? Why have I not the seen photos? this? Show it to me. So like <laughs> the, like we were just, we were at the airport. So she mentioned we went Yellowstone with the, with the Z8 a year ago. So like if you watched Petapixels, like first launch of videos with Chris and Jordan, one of the first ones that went out there was the, the, the Z8. And uh, that was because Christy helped plan that. She was there with us. That's where we met. So I was sitting in the airport with Christy and she just mentioned like this tadpole thing that she was doing. And I'm like, just hold on a sec. Can you let me see them? And we published a whole story <laughs> on it. We'll show some today as well and during the podcast so you can actually see what she's talking about. But like this, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Every time I talk to her, she mentions this amazing project she was doing like offhandedly, like that's oh, not a big deal or anything. But it's just like, yes, it is a big deal, Christy. Show me your pictures. <laughs> I'm really excited about this B picture. And um, 
Jeremy contacted me from over there. I think he's publishing it in some story in the future for Petapixel, yeah. and he's going to talk about the behind the scenes. So keep an eye out on the Petapixel website for that. Good. <laughs> so Chrissy, do you think you're going to use the Z8 more often now? Because obviously the Z9 would make more sense before this firmware update. Like as a wildlife photographer, do you see yourself using the Z8 more now? I think it's going to be a great little camera trap. Like, I mean, I, I, I love both the Z8 and the Z9, but the Z9 is my, it's right. my, it's, it's my fave. And so having the Z8 where I could set it up on a camera trap and then take photos while I'm, you know, waiting to see what had happened. So like, for instance, like speaking of underwater, like I invested in a underwater housing and I had to really decide, am I going to bring the eight or the nine underwater? And um, mm. I chose the nine and I chose the nine for a couple of reasons. The second CF express card slot, like you right. can't change out your cards in an underwater housing that easy. And also the battery, like having it encased, having a longer battery life, it, it suits me. I also, you know, I know you can add a vertical grip to the eight, but I really like the vertical grip on the nine. So Yes, I love the 9, and I love that it has those features. It's going to be great for birding, because sometimes, you know, the 9 gets a little heavy, so holding it up for extended periods of time on birds, I could see... I, I'm going to pull the 8 out a lot more, let's say, and it, it, right. it might become my camera trapping camera. Very cool. Well, <laughs> everyone can get that Z8 firmware. It's available now. You can try it out. They also updated uh, NX Tether. If anyone's interested in that, I'll put a link in the description below. You can read all about what they've uh, done there. Uh, and also that link will provide you a link to Nikon's website where you can find the firmware and download it yourself if you have that camera. Uh, before we dig more into Christie's insanely good work, um, I want to first touch on Canon and Sony for like the last three years have both <laughs> found ways to say that they're the number one selling mirrorless camera brand in the United States. Canon said it was like on the like a, the, the eighth i think yeah on the eighth they just said they were the number one mirrorless brand and they are citing a independent company that does these it used to be called npd now it's called circana and they apparently track stuff they don't publish any of this publicly you have to pay them for access to their data and all these companies do and they're just like that's it we're the number one brand i asked sony i emailed them like so is this what do you guys feel about this? And they're like, actually, <laughs> we have that same NPD data or Circana data. And it says that they found that they were the number one full frame mirrorless brand. And they the A7R4, or sorry, the A7 IV was the number one full frame camera last year. You'll notice mm -hmm. there's a slight difference in what they're saying. Canon right. says they're the number one mirrorless brand. Sony says they're the number one full frame mirrorless brand. So that tells us that Canon sold more units overall counting both full frame and less and Sony just sold the most full frame right of note Sony actually said something that I kind of appreciated they didn't put together a big press release or a logo or anything like Canon did they said despite these accomplishments we made the decision to refrain from pub publicly broadcasting any of these claims via a press release or any other type of formal announcement we are an organization that is focused on innovation, on supporting creators, on bringing products to market that allow them to capture things that have never been captured before. <laughs> they basically are like, yeah, we could have, but this is dumb and we didn't yeah. want to. So, but I, <laughs> but I know that when we have press briefings and they tell us about new gear, they're going to mention yeah. that a lot. They the always briefings. they always preface everything with about, if, if it's going to be a 40 minute briefing, <laughs> the first 10 minutes are... Uh, everything they've accomplished, how many lenses yeah. they've made. Uh, By the what, way, do you know where the uh, number one full frame? Yeah, right? they'll, they'll bring it up, but they didn't do a big uh, hoopla like Canon did. Yeah. I find this a little tiresome. It's part of our job to report when companies say this kind of thing. So that's sure. why we do it. And, you know, of course, there are those who have read these stories and complained. Like, why would you even? Because we're a news site and it's news. That's why. <laughs> uh, I just found this this whole thing funny. And I'm kind of with Sony on this one. Like, who cares, man? Yeah. It's got to be tough, though. Like, you know, obviously the market is is very volatile right now. And everybody's worrying about numbers and stuff like that. And phones and the changing, uh, you know, climate uh, that is the photo industry. So I get that. Uh, I, I, I understand why a company would want to do it. You know, it is press. Press is press. But yeah, it's interesting that Sony didn't do a rebuttal. That's okay. I'm all right Good with them. Not. Um, I'm, with I'm curious said, how Nikon did this year, just because of all the... Uh, well, there, if you look share. at Nikon's financials, real well. 
as a company, yeah. they have they have very much turned things around from a couple of years ago when I was genuinely concerned for the health of that company. Right. And uh, everything looks really nice now. So they, they may not be like the number one, but they haven't really lived in that space for quite some time. And it hasn't no. really mattered to them. They they focus on what they're doing. And uh, I can appreciate that. Um, on that note, let's talk about yep. pretty pictures. Yeah. Taken with said Nikon camera. We're going <laughs> to, I broke this. Christy sent me like a big old stack of pictures when I asked her for her underwater shots and I broke them into sections. So the first one we're going to talk about is this picture of two birds. And I'm going to share my screen here with these two so that we can all look at the same thing together. Uh, da, da, da. I have and so many questions. <laughs> the first one we're going to talk about, um, Chris, describe the picture for anyone only listening. Right. So, so I mean, the first thing that you really notice about Christie's underwater work is like, it's not just the subject matter, but the ocean itself becomes a really interesting backdrop in these photos. Sometimes with just patches of light, sometimes with rays of color, sometimes just as a clean backdrop. So anyways, we have these two diving birds. I don't know the species, but of course, Christy does. And uh, just with the vertical orientation, you've got one diving bird coming from the top, another coming from the bottom. You know, they're doing this dance. They're pulling away from each other. It's really quite beautiful. It's quite calming. How do you get birds to dive on both sides of you here, Christy? Because it's like you're surrounded by diving birds. Oh my goodness. So I went to South Africa's sardine run last year. And it's like the great migration of the sea, the sardines and the other little fish mm. all get together in these bait balls. And that brings in the whales, the dolphins, the birds, the sharks, and all these different animals. So these gannets, they hit the water. I, I read about the speed yesterday, and I totally forgot, but it is, it is so fast. Occasionally, <laughs> they even break their neck because they hit the water with such force to kind of push themselves under, propel themselves under to get their, get the fish. And so one of the things like when I showed up to the sardine run, one of the things I first noticed were these, these birds that were, I mean, they sounded like torpedoes when you're underwater. It's just like the sound was so amazing. Mm -hmm. I need to start getting some underwater audio, you know, of the, that sound was so cool. And like, I was on the surface of the water. I was doing more free diving and snorkeling. So they were just diving in all directions underneath me. And one came from behind and one came from the front. So they would go underwater and, you know, they would swim in these different directions looking for fish. So I thought that was, that was pretty phenomenal. I do want to point yeah. out something about my underwater photography because it is in a way I, it's a little different than what I photograph on land because underwater, I do find that I remove back scatter in the water. Whereas I would never remove anything from my terrestrial images, which I think it's, but underwater, there's a lot of um, bubbles and debris and things that catch the light. And I end up, um, I do end up removing that. So this has some backscatter removal, um, you know, around the birds to kind of make it clean and bring that emphasis over to the birds. But I do like to let people know when there's additional editing on my images. Absolutely. Never heard, I don't think I've ever heard the term backscatter, but I totally understand what it means when you say it in context. Um, as long as an artificial intelligence isn't doing it, people will be okay for now. So it's, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, it's your, we're your artistic touch. Here. Well, you know, it's super interesting though, because the dodging and burning and being able to select sky, that's AI. And I do that sort of AI. I do like, you know, selecting my subject, selecting my background for dodging and burning now. So I feel like AI is in a way like there's different levels of where you can use it where, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I just feel like just be transparent, just be transparent. Let people know. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love how these birds, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're plunging in the water and it's like, they're, they're still surrounded by like a bubble of air mm -hmm. that's just attached to their bodies. And, and yeah, it's, it's surreal. Were you pre-focusing for that? Were you just, you know, like lots of depth of field? What were you doing to capture that? You know, I actually like, I threw my Z9. I had the Z9 and the Nauticam housing with the 14 to 30 F4 lens. And I chose that lens because it went all the way to 30, which gives me a little bit more versatility underwater as opposed right. to the 14 to 24. Um, so I, I had the 14 to 30 and I did 3D tracking, which I never use on land, which is kind of funny. I think 3D is getting like better and better though. Like I've started throwing my camera over and going, 
oh my gosh, 3D is getting really good. But That's all for, I use. Yeah, yeah I only really? use 3D tracking. Yeah, On, for Nikon's. Uh, but we're not doing stuff as critical as you are. No. Yeah, <laughs> at no I'm point like, have I done anything this It's because we're lazy, Christy. It's because we're lazy. <laughs> I do my wide area autofocus with animal eye tracking or human eye tracking. Yeah. But underwater, it was just, you know, there's a lot of... I, I found 3D to just as much as I could set the camera up to do automatically. And I think that's one of the things about like, even when I moved to mirrorless, I wanted to shoot it like a DSLR, but mirrorless, you've got to like hand over controls to the camera and it sings yeah. when you do that. So I think that like doing this, I was going, oh my gosh, maybe I should start using 3D tracking <laughs> more because uh, yeah, the Z9 nailed it underwater. So hmm. I did have like a higher aperture on these shots just to kind of like keep it on the safe side. And, um, you know, I mean, nowadays, oh my gosh, like the noise reduction, the new noise reduction in the Lightroom is insane. So I don't yeah. mind going a little higher with my ISO if I need to, because, whew. I'm like going back and re-editing so many old pictures. I'm like, oh my gosh. Do you mind me sharing some of your settings here? Because I can see them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope I okay. watch me be at like minimum aperture after saying. No, you were at F6.3. <laughs> you were right. You closed down a little yeah. bit here. Uh, your ISO was at 2000 and you were shooting at 1 16,000th of a second. Yeah, you can't get much light. I mean, you're on the surface, right? Like you're actually on the surface of the water here, mm -hmm. but uh, you still lose light so quickly, hey? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Do, do you find that you like, I know a lot of people use flashes, but are you kind of like, yes to flash underwater? No, sometimes. I am going to be moving in that direction. Um, I yeah. used to do flash underwater. I used to have a Nikonis 5 and I had my strobe oh. systems and I put Velvia 50 in there, which was super unforgiving. And I'd have all of 36 shots underwater, but it was glorious. I could take pictures underwater. I was, that's, one of the reasons I got into nature photography is I was so passionate about scuba diving and I'd go on these trips with my dad and I was like, I want to keep these moments. But now it's like, yeah, I can put two one terabyte <laughs> CF Express cards in and I come back. 2000 and, ISO. <laughs> yeah. And just, you know, and you can get your exposures off by what, like, what's the exposure? Like, I feel like I can be off by like four stops and correct it, even though you don't want to oh, do that. Sure. But like the mirrorless cameras, <laughs> they're like, it's, it's so nice. <laughs> it's so much easier <laughs> than it was back in the day, but I want to get back to using lights. I'm just, I do so much filmmaking that it's a, a balance for me of like underwater, photo versus video like do I want a static light that's probably not going to give me enough power but the thing is is that like yeah I'm just kind of getting back into underwater photography after a, I had a little bit of a break from it for a while and um I'm, I'm doing small steps so getting comfortable mm -hmm. with free diving getting comfortable with the camera and then yeah, I'm going to play with some strobes for sure. If, this you, year. Wow. if these are small steps, my God. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to do here, Christy, is I'm going to go through these pictures that you sent. Uh, these are what I've categorized as the sharks, dolphins, and whales section. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're just going to take uh, a look at some of these. And if you want to talk about any in particular about like the situation that you went into, Chris, if you have any questions about like how this picture came together, like yeah, the whale I'll, shark. I'll pause. So this first one here is a whale shark. That is spectacular. I'll yeah, take a print of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to send you one. <laughs> this was a fun shot because it was, uh, once again, I was on the surface. Um, so I I love diving, but if you can take photos from the surface, like, you know, snorkeling, it's, it's nice. You yeah. get great light. So when I was swimming around, I noticed that the sun was actually diffracting around my body. And diffraction is when an object causes light to bend. And I was able to kind of like control where these lines were going. I put my hands up and I could, you know, wave my fingers and I felt like it wow. was magic. And so I, I swam and I swam and I swam because I wanted the patterns. I wanted the lines from the light to hit the, the, the pattern on the back of the whale shark. So I ended up swimming into a school of jellyfish without a wetsuit. So there was some pain after <laughs> the shot. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> and I was on an island without medical facilities. So yeah, there was some problems, but I got a good photo that I like. And this one ended up um, <laughs> winning a nature's best award. It put it up in the um, Smithsonian, yeah. the natural history museum for a year, which it was nice because there's like over 8 million people that go through that museum. And, and that's when I realized that, you know, I can use my camera and really shout out about the beauty of nature to a larger audience. And, yeah. and that felt good to me, you know? 
it's it's um, neat to know like the backstory behind this stuff is is as fascinating as the photos just because like you know i think i think a lot of people maybe assume myself included when you see these underwater photos like oh we're talking hundreds of pounds of gear and you're all rigged up for scuba and all this kind of stuff so it's interesting that you were just basically like snorkeling in the ocean like we all do playing with light with her hand really, pointing a camera yeah, down just have have a really it just nice makes like camera. one of the most spectacular <laughs> underwater photos i've ever seen in my life i like yeah. how you're like christy you're you're so freaking talented all right i'm gonna i'm gonna move on uh there's a this is a a, a whale tail is that what i'm looking at here uh-huh yes and I think like Maybe. what I saw when I saw this whale is I just like the chaos of it, like how it interacts with the surface of the water. So I wanted to yeah. like kind of hone into that, that chaos there. And the light, once again, like underwater, the light is just so beautiful that, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, the, what strikes me here, you got, you have for people that aren't maybe just listening, like you got so much chaos, there's bubbles everywhere, right? The photo, it looks like you're very close. How close are you to a gigantic ma- uh, mammal that's got a gigantic tail? While I don't approach wildlife myself, sometimes it approaches you. I was actually photographing dolphins and this whale just came oh. up. And um, yeah, so it was, uh, it did get a little closer than, than you know, but I mean, this is at whale... 16 millimeters. So yeah, that thing was <laughs> close. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't encourage that sort of, yeah, but sometimes the, you know, when a whale's coming towards you, there's little you can do to get out of its path. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I did what I could and I only snapped a couple of shots. It was very quick interaction, but one of those is just, it gets your heart going, you know, it was uh, seeing a whale and being in the presence of a whale. It's, it's, yeah. uh, God, we live on such an amazing planet and I just, I feel like, you know, I get to live out this dream of being in the ocean with these creatures. Like I'm just forever grateful, you know? So one question that comes to mind, Chris, I want to answer it is like, when you're shooting wildlife on, on land, I feel like, and I've done a bit of it. We had a great time together in Yellowstone and stuff. I feel like, you know, it's a different experience where you kind of really focus through the viewfinder and you're focusing on the animal. You know, I'm looking for things like trying to get the timing, trying to get the bird in flight, all that kind of stuff, right? And I feel like it's a very sort of tunnel vision kind of experience myself. Yeah. But underwater, I'm curious, like, how does it change as far as you know, you're surrounded by water, in some cases surrounded by wildlife, like you're getting stung by jelly. Like how, is it a different experience where you're focusing on getting the picture or I don't know, does that make sense? Like what's the actual visceral experience like? And is it different than when you're on land, you know, warmly clothed, lying down on a rock, trying to get a shot with a long telephoto? One of the biggest powers that we have as photographers is to put our passion and actually put our emotions and feel when we take pictures. And I think that's what really brings that extra element into wildlife photography. So the more comfortable you can get with your settings, the more comfortable you can get with your camera, the more you can shoot from your heart. So, and that's one of the reasons why I'm baby stepping back with the underwater photography. I'm doing less diving than I used to, more stuff on the surface. Mm. And I'm doing more, um, you know, keeping it simple for now, simple with the lighting, because I want to be able to shoot with heart. And it's it's always baby steps, like add a flash, add another yeah. flash, add another flash. So it's, it's, it's challenging because in the ocean, you've, I mean, the sardine run was, you know, we've got a video that hopefully we'll share where you can see the chaos. And um, yeah, it's, there's a lot going on that sometimes, yeah, yeah. this video. So I said two of these, I don't know if you did the, oh, this one's got the slow motion, but this is when the shark actually ran into me and it was, it happened so fast that I, oh my gosh, Beluga. Oh, there's so many videos. Okay. Um, but <laughs> I'll keep sh- us focused here. Yeah. Like the, the chaos, like, cause you, you just meant like the pictures that were, I showed prior to this, it looks almost peaceful and like yeah. isolated. And then like there's this video, video which is the polar opposite of all that. So we <laughs> like for anyone just listening, what we just watched was essentially a pod of dolphins, uh, hundreds sharks. of fish, sharks. And then out Eight of the left hand corner of this shot, while we're watching all this, a shark just like appears right next to Chris Christie and like engulfs fish. And it's just like, you see teeth 
and they're very close to you. It is very much <laughs> like this is the reality. I, I, is that is that what what you're saying? Like, like that's what I mean, Christy. Are you like are you just like trying to focus on the image, or are you still like aware spatially of all the stuff going around you, or what is oh, that like? Oh my gosh, for this it was so fun because you're also looking through goggles or you're looking through your mask, and so like you don't yeah. have as much. You know, you just don't have as much, um, you know, vision as if you would normally on land. So I know when this happened, like I was filming at the very beginning, you see the dolphins and the beautiful light and it's like this stunning light. And they're, I'm like, look at the dolphins. They're in this great light. And then what happened here was I was keeping my body very still. And this was mackerels, right, Chris? Does that sound like the right fish? I know, you know, your fish. <laughs> I, you know, I know my freshwater fish. Sure. Okay, no worries. <laughs> but these, um, this, this sure. bait ball of mackerels, like they're trying to get away from all these predators and they decided to use my body. So they came up and hid from the sharks and dolphins around my body. And when they did safe. that, yeah, I mean, it was so quick. I mean, I didn't even have time to kind of get out of there. And then when they did uh. that, the... You know, there was so much going on because right after this, a dolphin comes in from the other side and, and eats one as well in front of the camera. And um, when they did this, I remember thinking like, there's so much chaos. I think I was just hit by a shark and you can see the yeah, whole that camera shake. You. Yeah, you can see the camera yeah. shake when I get I get smacked by it. And I was going, I'm not 100% sure because this was so fast, but I had my Z9 rolling wow. at 120 photos per second. And I know that right after this happened, I was like, I don't even, I can't process what just happened. Like I, there was so much that I just swam back to the boat and I was like, I need a timeout. And I got out of the water oh, and I yeah. was like, that was intense, but I'm not quite sure. And then we ended up like going back to, you know, our, our accommodation for the night and the dive master shows me this photo. <laughs> This one. He yeah. shows me this photo and he goes, I want to see what you were shooting when this happened. And I was like, that's fake. <laughs> like, that's AI. Like, this is fake. That's that's the dome port of my um, Nauticam housing. And that has a Z9. And you can see my gloves with the logo on the top. Wow. And I looked at him and I thought he was kidding. So this was a screen grab from the gentleman next to me that had a GoPro rolling during this. And... Um, I, I really thought that this was fake. And then I ended up going into my room and I played the video. I screamed in my room. I was like, oh my God, because I was I was <laughs> shaking. I can't I couldn't believe like that's when I finally processed that yeah, that shark did hit me. And um it was it was kind mm -hmm. of intense. I mean, it was intense. Like I know that I yeah, I kind of So the, the, I I this is I didn't ask you to explain this when you sent all this. So this is news to me. This still is from this video where yeah. you are where you, so okay yeah. yeah that shark is yeah and it goes like millimeters. right over your shoulder and bumps into you and it's got a fish in its mouth at that time yeah. that is so, insane wow. it actually if you yeah. watch the video you can see that it it, it pulls the, the the fish and the fish almost gets away and then it goes yeah, yeah. the second time and chomps it like so it it has this like yeah but it chomped it like right in front of the camera and yeah. um it was I mean, I was pretty excited about this footage. Like, it was definitely, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and I was trying uh, to film the, the dolphins in the beautiful light, and that happened. So, I'm going to stick to rivers. I'm going to stick to rivers. Rivers are good. This is rivers a, and lakes. Think, this is a good opportunity to talk specifically <laughs> about your gear. You've mentioned it a little bit. Um, so, like, what are you equipped with? How do you decide what you're going down with? Um, if anyone wanted, I'm not necessarily suggesting anyone go swim and photograph sharks, but like some people will want <laughs> to do this too. Um, let's say you wanted to go underwater and shoot wildlife down there. Like what would you want to be equipped with? Like, what do you need to think about to bring down there? So you need a good housing for your camera. And I will say I've been through many housings. Like I've even had companies mm. send me housings to try out and no. Uh, then I had, a. My friends over at Backscatter that uh, loaned me out a naughty cam housing for my honeymoon. <laughs> we went swimming with whales on my honeymoon. And once you go naughty cam, like you can't go back. Oh my gosh, it's mm. like the Royals Royce of underwater housings. It's so it's it's more pricey for sure, but I mean it is so easy to access all your buttons, and the more you can connect with your camera, the more you don't have to think about things. It's got like a got a sensor in there the beep it goes off if there's any sort of moisture inside it's got a vacuum seal and oh, yeah. it's 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 the full i mean it's big 
it's a big housing. Like it's definitely like um, it's a little bit of a chore to kind of, uh, you know, I have to have, I have to check it on the flights, which always makes me nervous. I have, it's got its own <laughs> Pelican box and it's, right. um, but it is, and then you have to get the glass and the dome system and um, you know, the port system and things like that. And like I said, the next step is going to be the lighting, but um, yeah, Naughty Cam is, Naughty Cam makes a, a, a quality product for sure. <laughs> And then it's, it's so most of the time is it's light. Like, can you, well, I guess while we're still on the topic of gear, how many cameras have you lost um, or have you? I've flooded a few. Um, <laughs> actually, let me rephrase that on my honeymoon. My husband flooded one. That was fun. <laughs> um, he flooded the, a, a different housing. It was one that we were sent out that um, it was not naughty cam or acolyte. It was another brand. And um, yeah, he totally flooded it. It was fun. Um, <laughs> it's like, let's see how tolerant your new spouse is. Like, I just flooded your, <laughs> but no, it's all good. I love him to death. It was hilarious. He also sunk his drone. There was a lot of, a lot of damage oh, to gear on that, that trip. <laughs> but, um, and then, uh, you know, I'm trying to think that one flooded, um, been the only one really. Was there more? Oh, I think my, pretty lucky. I think, I think my Nikonis five eventually like started to, get water yeah. seeping in but i mean i, I mean I, I got that camera what 25 years ago i don't know when i yeah it definitely wow. but i'm trying to think have i flooded anything else i i don't know i just That's know that my experience my limited experience with these housings is they are super prone to leaking if you, you got to be getting, diligent right about yeah about and even yeah. if you are they, they eventually start to fail yeah. over time like they're not going to last forever I mean, you got uh, yeah. what some of the most corrosive like salt water that you're putting it into. <laughs> yeah. So you have to like, yeah. I mean, I have to like put a pretty much a magnifying glass and check every single O ring and have the right yeah. amount of moisture on it and like right around the grease. There's a lot of like people get back from an awesome dive and they'll be all like, let's have fun and have a drink. And I'm like, I'm going into my room with my camera because I got to do it to check. <laughs> like, but there's, you know, you got to soak it in fresh water and, you know, there's all sorts of things you have to do with your underwater camera to yeah. housing to make sure it stays safe. So if you're free diving on the surface, I mean, that's one thing, right? You can go down a little bit, down a few feet, get shots, pop back up. How, how does scuba change all that? Because of course, now we're talking about full on dive gear. How does it change the dynamic of what kind of photos you can get, what angles you can shoot, that kind of stuff? Scuba to me is very relaxing. Like it's, hmm. you've got this... I mean, the housing's heavy um, and the housing with the camera, I don't remember the numbers, but I think, I think it was around 14 pounds or something like it's heavy. And, um, and that's with the lens and the port and everything. Like, I think I weighed it, but don't quote me on that because <laughs> I get numbers wrong all the time. And I ended up like, once you get in the water, it's weightless. Like it's, it's buoyant. Right. So it's like, you can pull it with your pinky and things like that. And being weightless yourself and just being able to be submerged, it's actually like, you just feel completely free to take pictures as long as there's not that hard current or any of the challenging mm -hmm. things that sometimes comes with diving. But, um, you know, instead of just being focused on the camera, you got to be focused on your oxygen, how much you're, you know, <laughs> how much you're breathing at different depths and, you know, just different things. So there's a lot more factors with the the scuba diving. So it's baby steps, get comfortable with diving, get, I actually find free diving harder because I suck at holding my breath. Can I say that? I suck at holding my breath. <laughs> I also it's suck like, at holding my breath. <laughs> think there's Tell like me, a can, can you, <laughs> can you get down to, to like a decent depth free diving to be able to shoot like up? Uh, at, uh, yeah. at fish and whales and stuff. you totally can but when you're like going down a lot of times like you're you know you've got to blow your bubbles and things like that and and yeah. so looking up you've got all these bubbles so there's like you got the chaos of like getting down holding your breath looking around like i i i'm actually like contemplating having some free diving classes like i i definitely want to like get an instructor but um yeah, yeah, I have to. I have to wait. I'm not allowed to swim for the next couple of months, so <laughs> there's there's that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> wait, uh, why? Ah, uh, everyone, wear your sunscreen. That's for sure. I'm dealing with a little bit of a little bit of a oh. removal of skin cancer, so <laughs> that's my little PSA today. Is to oh. wear that <laughs> sunscreen for wear sure. Your sunscreen, but um, yeah, I think it's yeah, going to be yeah. a little while before I can swim because of the 
the stitches healing up. So, yeah. Oh, yikes. Well, I hope you're okay. I'm good. Um, it's all margins are clear. Good. I'm all good. I'm, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> no worries. I <laughs> well, just, I'm going to get a big scar on my forehead, which I don't know. Maybe it'll. Those are always cool. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Tough. We'll keep, yeah. <laughs> not not to uh to feel like i'm rushing us but i do want to get to a couple of other no, things christy worry. you want you wanted to talk about this video while it played so i'm going to play this mangrove okay. video that you mentioned and so, you can talk over it this is um this is some b-roll from a campaign i did last year so last year i teamed up with an ngo they hired me to do a save the mangrove video um, I did two of them and I got to play them and, as well as get on stage and speak at an event in New York for their donors. And through the photos and video, the event ended up raising half a million for mangroves. So I was pretty excited to be part of that event. Mm -hmm. I was pretty excited to be able to use my photography to talk about something like mangroves because mangroves are like a massive carbon offset and they have this ability to protect coastal lands from hurricanes and from different weather patterns that we've been seeing with with changes in climate mm -hmm. and so it was um I wanted to bring this up. I know that these are just like random B-roll. And I did have a amazing Annika Ivins. She was my drone pilot that came down with me. Um, so some of the drone work was from her and some of the time lapse. But I just wanted to show like a little mix of some of the B-roll that incorporated the underwater photography as well as the wildlife photography, as well as some aerial work that, you know, it it helped raise money, which makes me happy. So, yeah, that's what this is. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> the last so, I mean, thing. Oh, no, sorry. You you got go, video Chris. work is, yeah, sorry, video work as well as photography, right? I mean, it's a totally different kind of mindset. Uh, Jordan and I were kind of talking about the underwater drone thing. Has that come across your plate yet? This whole robotic uh, underwater drone kind of stuff? I'm such a baby step person. I'm not ready for <laughs> any of that quite yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I've, I've seen some like crazy photos. I just want to encourage anyone that, um, uses that sort of equipment that they make sure that they realize the impact it has on wildlife. Because I've heard of a lot of yeah. um, underwater drones harassing animals in the water um, to get closer and to get those shots. So just be ethical when you, when you, if you are I venturing. See that. Yeah. I mean like. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same rules when flying an aerial drone, people mm -hmm. will harass wildlife using those as well. So it's like, don't do that either. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think that detachment makes people feel like, oh, they're safe and they're comfortable to go do whatever, right? Yeah. And you're not actually yeah. seeing one them with your eyes; you're seeing them through a screen, and that, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there's something about like, you know, wildlife. If they see us in the water, if they're super comfortable, like maybe you know they'll stick around. But a lot of times, wildlife disappears. It's like drones; people can just like right in the animals' faces. Like it's it's right. it's a different like. I don't know. It breaks my heart. Some of the horror stories I've heard about underwater drones and, and just harassment of yeah, like polar bears yeah. that are in the water and things like that. Like it kind of hurts my heart to hear about that stuff. Um, yeah. so. Well, that's good to talk about. Yeah. Um, the last thing that I, you wanted to talk about, and I mentioned it earlier is some of your tadpole work. I'm going to link to a story specifically about these tadpoles that we did last year. Uh, when I mentioned that when Christy's like, oh yeah, I shoot tadpoles. I'm like, I need the story now. So we wrote a story like within the next two weeks, we got it all together. But this is, I was going to frame this as, let's say you don't have underwater housing. You don't have yeah. the ability to necessarily go to these locations where these fish are. Maybe you can't swim, all those things. You can still do underwater photography. So Christy, how do you do underwater photography without going underwater? So this is a story that I'm working on, on the disappearing boreal toads that they used to be all over Colorado. Now there's only an estimate of about 900 adult toads in the population. So they've been mm. completely getting wiped out. So it's a conservation story, but to get that photo, to get that story together, one of the key elements was getting a picture of this tadpole and tadpoles, like they're tiny, <laughs> like they're so tiny. <laughs> and like when I looked at it through my, um, I had a 50 millimeter on uh, macro on my um, Z9 for the shot. And you can see like these chubby cheeks and they have these spots that already are their unique identifiers. So it was, and you can see all these like, oh my gosh, I was so excited to get that shot, but it did take me multiple times. So I want to say, because um, it's important for me to say this, that I did work with experts uh, to get those photos. So I wasn't taking any tadpoles out of the wild or anything like that. And these tadpoles have been um, 
like Denver Zoo is actually like they found a way to help speed up the production of, of tadpoles and they're putting tadpoles back out in these populations that are, you know, where the, the frogs are disappearing. So it's a story I'm really passionate about, but to get the shot, like it took me a couple of trips to Denver Zoo and, and um, the first couple of times I went there, yeah, there's my setup. Oh, um, it was, it was like, it was, it was hard. So I used static light because I wanted to be able to use more of the autofocus on the camera. And I will say like the Z9's animal eye tracking worked on the eye of a tadpole. I was really surprised about that, but I had two Astera pixel bricks. I had a little tank set up. It was, and then I had like, I had a little hood that I put on top of my 50 millimeter so that when I put the camera up to the the plexi or um, the plastic, it didn't have any sort of reflections. Um, oh yeah, you can yeah. see the animal eye tracking there. Yeah, it was. Oh, I nice. was so ex- <laughs> so excited about that. Like technology is getting so much better. It just it makes me so excited. Um, but these tadpoles, like they're so fast and erratic that it was a super challenge to get these photos. Hmm. Um, but. I bet now it'd be easier, especially with all the firmware updates. But um, yeah, that's my setup. And the one thing I will say about this shoot that just really touched my heart in many ways was the fact that like literally probably 20 photographers helped me brainstorm how to do this shoot. So it was a lot of um, the community is just so amazing. And a lot of times if you're like, I need a photo of a tadpole, the way people come together and give advice, like, from, you know, Paul Van Allen and uh, NPS and all these other people that just like, and I even had like Michael Dion from NPS come with me on the shoot one day. And it was just, it was beautiful to see how many people came together so that I could get a photo of Tadpole. And that's, that speaks to the amazingness of our industry and collaboration that photographers have. Well, right on. Well, Christy, thank you so much for talking about underwater photography with us. Um, it's something that I, it's one of those disciplines and skills that I think that among even people who are doing this at, at your level of, which is very high, I'd like to point out, it's rare even then, like um, they're very good yeah. underwater photographers and like getting great shots underwater is difficult and there's not a lot of people doing it. And I wanted, just wanted to give you the opportunity to share that with people because we think you're awesome. So hopefully <laughs> that came beautiful. across. I think you all are awesome. And one time we need to go out there all together for the sardine run. Chris would love all the fish out there. Have so much fun. Yeah, I don't we know if I do... do any photography. You guys are going to you guys are going to hooked is what's going to happen. I don't know. Was That's that a pun? A great idea. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Okay. All right. So thank you for that. (laughs) Anyone who wants to learn more about Christy's work, I'll put a link in the description below. Also a link to all of the stories we've done on her so that you can learn more about her stuff. And let's, let's not forget that Christy also takes plenty of wildlife photos on land as well. Right. I mean, you you go to Africa, you go to North America. I mean, you photograph all animals, right? I do. I do. I get to travel a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that note, Chris, um, I would probably have skipped this section this week if I didn't notice that you brought something on your desk. Oh. So I'm going to give you a chance to talk about what you've been up to this week. Oh, what have I been up to this week? Well, no, I just want to point this. So this is really nice because you know I love to fish. Maybe you guys have heard that once or twice. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, this lovely gentleman named uh, Vlad Rachenko, uh from Ukraine, he sent me this fly reel that he makes. He's an aerospace engineer. Uh, and it's gorgeous. I was about to swear because it's that nice. <laughs> But uh, I just want to point out, big thanks to him for uh, for sending this. It's beautiful. Listen to it. You know, oh. I'm, not a, I'm not a big fisherman, but I do like that sound. I, I, have, a, I have a seasickness issue, but you you stand on the side of a river. So I guess I could do that if I really wanted to. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like they're works of art. They're made in a very classic style. He also makes beautiful reels at a titanium. But I just, I, it's so beautiful. Look, it goes on the Winston rods, the green and the green eyes. Just, mm. So I'm very excited about this. I can't wait to try it out as soon as the water turns to liquid again, uh, which will be, <laughs> I don't know, six months from now. I don't know how long it'll take. But I want to point that out. VR reels, uh, Vlad Rachenko, beautiful stuff. And uh, I can't wait to try it out uh i have nothing to add to this part of the conversation and we just talked about what christy's been up to for about 30 minutes so uh (laughs) we're gonna we're gonna move on to our tech support christy if you've got 
any feedback for any of these tech support questions, you jump in and you tell yes. Chris that you know better than him and that he needs to listen or to you. Or that you have said. something collaboratively to add. It doesn't always have to be a competition, Jared. Um, <laughs> You're the one who makes everything into a competition. <laughs> that is not true. Now, okay, now we're going to have a competition about who's more competitive. <laughs> All right, so we've got several speak pipes to get through. Those are when people are allowed to send us a voice message. If you would like to send us a voice message, there's a link in the description below. But we're going to listen to one from Tyler. Let's listen in. Howdy from Calgary. I am searching for a new camera, and I'm choosing between the X-T5 ZF and A7C2. I started my photo journey in film with the Nikon FE2. Lived to digital with an A7R2 and found the photos sterile and the UX UI awful. Now I'm shooting a Fuji X Pro 3. Love the results, but the handling's become an issue, and I'm not very happy with its autofocus. So things about how I shoot. First, I've got big old hands, and I'm realizing I need a decent grip. Second, I love adapting old manual focus lenses. Jordan really ripped into APS-C when doing this, and it's got me thinking. Third, I generally uh, shoot photo, street, urban landscape, both often at night, and personal travel. Let me know your thoughts between these three bodies or if I should look at something else as well. And thanks for all of your spectacular work. Mm. Hey, from Calgary, Tyler. Well, yeah, this is this is your question. Um, first off, I will say older Sony's, yes, the UX experience was terrible, but the interface now I think is way better. So I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, completely write Sony off now. The new modern bodies have a much nicer interface. I mean, it's almost night and day. If you've got larger hands, I could see the X-Pro3 being tough. The X-T5 would give you a slightly bigger grip, but something like a ZF would certainly... Uh, again, it's not a big grip, but it's it's a nice chunky body. You might want to add an additional grip or look at something like a Z8. Uh, the autofocus is definitely going to be better on pretty much anything you try nowadays. So I think you'll find that an improvement. Um Again, I would say Sony has a lot of adapters for manual focus glass. Some some for other brands, but Sony mount seems to get the lion's share of adapters. So that might be something to still look at. Look at a modern A7 IV or something like that, or A7R5. Uh, but otherwise, the Nikon ZF is really cool. I think a Z8, I know it's pricey, but uh, as I think we can all attest, we've all used them. The grip on that really does feel good. You know, it's a more solid grip, a little bit more of a weighty body. So maybe look at something like that. When we were in Idaho, um, and you, I, I think I managed to pry the the Z Z8 away from you a couple times. Yeah, my experience is shooting you. I think I shot the pictures of you fly fishing, actually. You with, did. They're so good. Oh, that was a so very beautiful. good experience. And yeah. I have smaller hands, but there was plenty of grip there for me, like yeah. way more than enough. So I, I kind of agree with that. Um, and I, I I mean, I can see Christy here would probably say, yeah, yeah, I get, <laughs> get that one too. Anything to add, Christy? Oh, it, I, I think if people are looking at doing like a full camera switch or something like that, like renting the gear, like either online or at your local camera store is exactly what I would do. And that way you could actually, because the cameras feel so different and what feels good for one person might yeah. not feel good for you. So I would recommend renting and, and seeing like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, smart. The, the the A7, that is a smart idea. The A7C2 that he mentioned and the A7CR, like they're nice, but again, they're smaller cameras. It's it's always hard, like you say, Christy, to judge what would work for me versus what work for someone else. I mean, I think the Z9 is a humongous camera, way too big. I don't like holding it. I far prefer the Z8. I'm happy with tiny cameras, right? So it, it's, it's all over the place. Um, what'll feel good for you? Well, our next question is Travis from London, and it's a similar situation. He's okay. trying to figure out what camera they'd li that he'd like to get. So let's listen in. Hey, all. Travis from London here. First of all, big fan of the videos and podcast. Thanks for everything. I have a question about vintage lenses on modern bodies, especially the idea that lenses cannot be good enough for high pixel count cameras, the so-called out-resolving problem. Here's the background. I was a Nikon shooter from 35mm through to the DSLR days. I have a good collection of AFD lenses, not AFS. They're all pro zooms and fast primes. This week, I finally saw the news I hoped for when the Z cameras launched, the release of an AFD compatible adapter for a mirrorless body. Sure, it's third party and it's for E-mount, but Sony seems to make good cameras, even if I'd prefer Nikon. So my question is, is it worth it to add a Sony body? If so, what should I look for? I have a D850, which is great, but is a total beast. 
And I wouldn't mind some computational additions to focus rules and things like that. To make it clear, I'm not sure what my photography future holds. I wouldn't say that I will never get new full frame lenses to replace my AFD lenses, but I'll always want to keep some of them for film. On digital, I've moved mostly over to OM systems, micro four thirds, except for low depth of field portraiture and very low light. What do you think? I'd love the same adapter on Z or even M43. I'd love some of the OM systems tech to get into full frame. Oh, and to add to my Festivus list, I'll take a new Pen F2 with the new Sony 47 megapixel monochrome sensor. Thanks. Yeah, wow, <laughs> lots there. Uh, I mean, but this is good because we'll kind of we'll kind of answer Tyler's question above as well, which we didn't we didn't answer yet. Um, so, for anybody that doesn't know, AFD first off, the older Nikon autofocusing lenses represent some challenges because the autofocus is based on a screw type drive. So, I'm assuming that this adapter will provide that. Otherwise, adapting AFD glass to other cameras is rudimentary. It's not not difficult. But if you want the autofocus, the adapter would have to support that screw drive, you know, and then and then interface with the body's autofocusing system. So that might be what they're talking about. I mean, there's so many adapters out there. Let's answer the first question. Uh, vintage glass on modern cameras. And I know I'm going to get flack for this. And yes, it, it can be very cool. Lots of character, unique look. Yes. But objectively, from a technical standpoint, that older glass is garbage, right? Like it compared to, <laughs> everybody's bad now, compared to modern lenses, it's there's just no competition. And I grew up with AF lenses. I grew up with manual focus lenses. And and i I get it. Like it was a very interesting time optically where manufacturers would be balancing all of these different things. Can I get rid of vignetting? Can I get rid of distortion? Cause you couldn't correct that digitally with film. Can I get, you know, can I still maintain good sharpness? Can I still get rid of chromatic aberrations? All this kind of stuff, wide open performance. And it was a real dynamic challenge. And nowadays lenses have the benefit of digital correction, either in camera or in post. And so the manufacturers nowadays are able to push in different directions, worry about maximum sharpness, wide open performance. They don't have to worry about distortion as much or vignetting as much. So those things don't get corrected for to the same degree. And it's just all about where you're going to push those envelopes to get the best result. Uh, and so I think it's awesome to put vintage glass on there. I totally support it. But from a standpoint of will it specifically work for high pixel count cameras? Generally, no. Generally, a lot of that old glass won't resolve for higher megapixel cameras. You won't get the ideal resolution out of it. As well, you're going to have things with corner sharpness and all the rest. And it's there's so much you could go down a rabbit hole. But you really got to use that vintage glass because you want the vignetting. You want the look. You don't mind the lack of sharpness. In some cases, the chromatic aberration, you'll get all that kind of stuff. Um, Put it on a Sony body, sure. I mean, E-mount has a lot of adapters. There's no problem with that. I, I imagine there's probably got to be an adapter for for Nikon Z. You know, a lot of these manufacturers now are coming out with that and they're going to make it. So go for it. Have fun with it. That's the key thing. Absolutely keep your AFD glass. There was some good stuff there. I rocked a 3570 F2.8 for a long time. That was that was a fun lens for sure. Okay. That was a long, long question, long answer. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, go for it. But is it going to give you the best out of your camera? No. So you got to do it for artistic reasons and for the fun of doing it. Yeah. Um, this next one I can really relate to. So let's listen to Philip Lanferman. Hey, guys. Philip from Germany here, as I'm sure you can tell from my accent. I uh, love the podcast and your shows over the years. I'm not feeling very inspired to shoot anymore, and it might be because my Sony system feels just kind of soulless to me. Of course, the grass is always green on the other side, but Fuji's offering feels so compelling and fun to shoot with. Am I being crazy, or is it really as much fun as it looks like in Fujiland? So, Philip, I mentioned that <laughs> I, I feel the same way as you, because after shooting for a job for a decade... Um, it really sucked the joy out of it because I wasn't ever really shooting for me. I was shooting for clients. Like I, mm. I tried to mix in personal work there to try and keep myself inspired to shoot more. But eventually that just wasn't enough. And I don't shoot for fun much anymore. Unless except, I'm fishing. Except in the case where I've got something like Chris fishing and it looks pretty and I, something <laughs> sparks. But really there's specific <laughs> cameras like holding my R5 does not spark joy. It sparks work. But there right. are cameras that I hold where I'm like, ooh, I'm taking this with me and I want to take pictures. One of those is a Leica, specifically the M-series Leicas. 
But I think this kind of touches on that where you're like thinking, well, what if I changed to a system that made me feel differently? And I will say, I'm not going to suggest you necessarily fully switch to Fujifilm or uh, I'm definitely not going to suggest you go out and buy a bunch of Leica equipment unless you're made (laughs) of money. But I can say that there is something to be said about what you're shooting with and how it makes you want to shoot more with. Yeah. Chris. Well, Christy, you've, you've had a long history with Nikon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. It sounds like uh, from film days. So have you dabbled with other brands and camera gear and how do you kind of feel about that whole thing about, about using the same gear or, or, or looking at other brands and coveting them? Well, I had the Nikon S5. Like I actually have gone through quite a few systems. So I started with a camera I inherited from my grandfather that was my Nolta. So I started my Nolta and mm-hmm. that went to Konica Minolta and that went to Sony. So I was Sony for a little while. And then um, I ended up switching. I didn't want to go to Nikon because I didn't want my dad to feel like he was right. And he always said Nikon was the best. So I went Canon. <laughs> <laughs> I went Canon for about 10 years. And um, actually, this is a funny story. Do you want to hear the story of when I went from Canon to yes, Nikon? Yes, please. So I had just done a wedding on a Saturday. I used to be a wedding photographer and that's how I funded myself to do all the nature stuff for over a decade. I don't do weddings anymore. Thank goodness. I mean, they were great. I got cake. Nobody. Yeah, it was. I, got it. It was, it was <laughs> I get where you're coming from. When you but, say that goodness, I get, I get it. <laughs> so it was, um, I had just done a Saturday wedding and I was exhausted and I was in, this is when I lived in the DC area. I lived in Northern Virginia and I was in DC having brunch with two other wedding photographers on Sunday. And it was really funny because one of them got a phone call. It's like, Hey, I'm a bridesmaid in a wedding and our photographer hasn't shown. What are you doing? And he's like, I'm having lunch with two other photographers. And he's like, do you all want to go save this wedding? And we're like, let's do it. <laughs> so we could, we didn't have, the wedding was in Maryland. We didn't have time to go back to Virginia to get my gear. So I was handed um, one Nikon. I think it was the D4S and one lens. I didn't have a, they didn't have a spare flash for me. Um, and I shot the whole wedding, one camera, one lens. And I remember like looking at my files from the Saturday and then the Sunday, and I shot better with a Nikon. Everything was, I had more consistency of things being in focus. I used to be like a aperture priority person. And I noticed that like, it was nailing it, even when the flower girl was walking towards me in speckled light. And I was going, oh my gosh, this system that I don't even know, I had more consistency. And um, Nikon ended up hearing that story and, uh, and, and, and <laughs> helping me try out some of their gear. And I shot two systems, both Canon and Nikon for six months. And I got to a point where I kept picking up the Nikon to take pictures. So I, the, the Canon just ended up being an accessory after a while. And with Canon, I always double clicked. Mm-hmm. And with Nikon, I didn't have to do that. I felt like I was it, I don't know. It was it was a, a better tool for me. So I ended up doing the switch and I switched all my gear. So I've gone through what my Nolta, Conor, Sony, Canon. And um, <laughs> yeah, I've been Nikon probably just for the last seven years. Yeah, but it, it's it's a great question. Like, I, I, I kind of am jealous when I think about these questions <laughs> in a way Cause because you don't get to feel this way because you're constantly testing everything. Yeah, you know, it's like I, I you know, I, I used to shoot Nikon myself. I have an FE. Uh, I love it. So, you know, my first camera, I still have it. And there's something about it that I covet, that I really enjoy. But yeah, I don't get to have a brand where I get used to it and I'm familiar with it, it becomes instinctual. I'm always using a new camera every week. And that that does a few things. I mean, first off, I feel like it naturally puts you into an attitude where you think less about the brand and the stigma that goes with the brand and the legend that goes with that brand. And you really start thinking more about them just as tools, yeah. right? I have to, I can't just be like even a Leica or, you know, the Fuji vintage inspired cameras. I can't really get too much into the styling. I really have to think, okay, but where's the autofocus? How does the menu work? You know, what kind of results am I getting? And so that forces you to look at them as tools. And so I appreciate that in a way because I can see where someone might say, oh, I'm kind of, my Sony is soulless or whatever. And I feel like 
honestly, all the brands are still just cameras and, and any perceived soul is really just going to maybe come from how they interface, how they look to you, you know, how they feel in your hand. But for the most part, I've, I've, I've largely separated myself away from that. And to me, they're all just shovels with different colored handles and slightly different shaped heads. Um, you know, and they all dig holes. So at the same time, I do get to play with fun stuff. Like we just played with the CFE 100 C and, you know, the Leica M11, I really enjoy, you know, we, uh, there, there are some interesting cameras there where you play with them and you're like, oh, okay, this is this has something where it's not necessarily practical, but it's beautiful to use. It's beautiful to look at. And I, I get that. I get that. I guess what I'm trying to say is I can't change if I can't change it if you're not enjoying the brand for whatever reason. But at the same time, in my experience, going to another brand, the most important thing wouldn't really be, you know, the soul. It'd be like, does it feel good? Does it operate well? I get it. I, I really like Sony. I haven't made any qualms about that. I love the Sony A7R5. I didn't like the old Sonys. They're always a pain as far as the menu system goes. But the new Sonys, maybe they don't have soul, but I like them because they just work. And and I think, Chris, you probably feel the same about Nikon, right? It's like, it just works well. You're familiar with it. You understand it. You can rely on it. And I think that is very important. So switching to another brand, it could be a crap shoot until you find out one that really kind of speaks to you. And then they might change the, uni- the the UI in a few years and you're going to be lost again. I don't know what to tell you. The grass is not greener on the other side. <laughs> if you can find the same, technology the same that green. lets you feel when you take pictures and you don't have to think about the tech, you're going to get more powerful shots. Yeah, for sure. All right. For sure. Next one is another speak pipe. This one is from Brandon. I have a question for Chris. Uh, as a fan of all things monochrome, which I know you are as well, it always seemed for a long time that only Leica was going to be making monochrome sensors and they were in a price range that was unattainable for most people. But now that Pentax has the K3 Mark III, which is a bit of a weird choice as an APS-C DSLR, I was wondering who you think would be next to offer a monochrome sensor. I know a lot of fans want one from Fuji, but I think realistically we could expect maybe one from Sigma in the form of a Fovion or on the video side, Zcam, I could see making one, but I was curious who you think would realistically be next to offer one. Huh, that's an interesting question. I, I'm kind of surprised that Fujifilm hasn't, but at the same time, because they're so big into the film simulation modes, maybe maybe that makes sense. You know, it's kind of this thing where it's like, well, uh, a black and white sensor that, that limits us from all the other film simulations we like to do. I think though, this is just, you know, fantasy stuff, but if Fujifilm did make a dedicated black and white camera that had a lot of their classic black and white film simulation modes, if you could switch between like Acros, of course, and like Neopan 400 and Neopan 1600 and stuff, that would be really cool. I, I don't know if there's a big enough market. I would love to see Nikon do it. I'm surprised that Nikon, you know, that might be, if I was going to think like what would be a realistic company that might actually jump on and do it, that could make sense. A black and white ZF would be <laughs> awesome. Um, did you play with the ZF, Christy, at all? No, I've, I've seen it and held it, but I haven't actually taken pictures. I have the ZFC. Yeah, I wouldn't I, classify it a wildlife. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, for video work, it's nice to have like a, a yeah, but um, I'm an 8 and 9 person. So I've got the 8 and 9 and the ZFC yeah, of as well. So the, the crop sensor is nice for. Oh, you have the ZFC. Okay, I have the yeah. ZFC, but not the, I mean, not the ZF. Right, right, right. Do you, so, but you do a lot of black and white work yourself. I do. And I actually like, I've manipulated the picture control to have a monochrome that, you know, I like being able to see the electronic viewfinder. So I sometimes shoot, you know, the photos in raw. I don't do a lot of raw video. So I I, I make sure it's not in monochrome for video, but I, (laughs) um, you know, I, I know it's not the same as a black and white sensor, but it's, it's, you know. I've gone in and really customized my picture control and my monochrome on there. And it, it feels good to me sometimes because I can see the light in the shadows. Yeah, no, abs- yeah absolutely. I mean, it, it's an interesting thing. I guess it's tough because it doesn't make a lot of marketing sense. You are getting benefits with the black and white sensor though, Brandon. So I don't know. Realistically, I would love to see Nikon make a dedicated one. Uh, Fujifilm, maybe it's surprising they haven't already, but I, I think they want to stick with their film, film simulation modes. Um so yeah, I think it's going to be down to the niche manufacturers, unfortunately. All right, we're going to do one more. This is technically tech support, but it's more like just like 
support support. You'll see what I mean by that in a second. Let's listen to Jeremy from SpeakPipe. Hello, Chris, Jordan, and Jaren. My name is Jeremy, and I recently picked up the nearly four pound Fuji GL690 medium format film camera. Despite the weight, I want to take it hiking for that sweet six by nine negative. My question is, what do you guys think the best way to carry it at the ready would be? I'm trying to avoid extra harnesses and straps beyond the backpack I'm already taking, but I wonder about comfort with a clip on the backpack strap. Love the podcast. Thanks. Mm. Told you. It's so about I support. Ha- I hate heavy cameras. So, Christy, I want to hear what you, because this is right up your alley, right? I mean, you are backpacking a lot. You're out in terrain a lot, and you're carrying heavy camera gear. So what kind of solutions work for you? Oh, my gosh. I don't, I, I, I mean, I love my think tank bags. I have everything in my mind shift, and um, I do kind of, I don't know. I keep a lot of my camera on lenses on the ready, and I just, like, carry it like a baby with my lens up. <laughs> kind of, okay. it's funny, but I, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any of the straps or the harnesses. I know when I did weddings, I had a harness cause I liked keeping weight on my hips. Um, but right. I don't have a good solution for this and I'd be interested if somebody else does. Cause yeah, I could definitely. Benefit. Have you tried any of the like peak design or cotton carrier kind of like clip it to your backpack strap stuff? Did you try any of that stuff? I've played around just a little bit, but it's yeah. like, I'm not like. I'm not a massive fan. I like having straps. I like having cushy straps around my neck. I don't, (laughs) I get a little scared of things on harnesses and I don't know the way I move. I'd be afraid of like smacking into the wall if I backed up. Like I just, I don't know. Interesting. I've watched Chris (laughs) multiple times eschew any type of help and he will just, he'll click to a tripod and he'll carry it like this. all around everywhere i've watched him hike like this so yeah. he's not very Scramble helpful rocks. In this either yeah yeah <laughs> helpful no well i you know <laughs> no i mean i i i do carry a camera a lot in my hands i hate neck straps i i basically refuse to use them i do like wrist straps absolutely and and i will wrist straps to me are really handy i mean i'm a big fan of them because i i do prefer to carry the camera in my hands or i'll have it in my camera bag you know, on my hip. But yeah, Jaren see me a lot of times like scrambling over big sharp rocks and you know, navigating rivers and stuff. And I've Tripod got this in one camera. hand as he's crawling with all the other three limbs. Yeah. Yeah. But see, I can hook my finger. I hook my pointer finger into the wrist strap while it's on the tripod so that if something tra- you know tragic happened, it's not going to fall too far. But, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not nice on camera gear. I'm pretty rough on camera gear. I don't like to baby camera gear. And for me, it's like, I'm fine with it getting nicked and scratched and beaten up and you know, especially because they're not my cameras and I send them away afterwards. So that's great. Um, but uh, a, four pound, a four pound GL 690, I mean, we are talking a big, heavy camera. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried a lot of the Peak Design backpack straps, but I would I would give that a shot. As I recall, the GL 6s, they're not going to have like a super long lens hanging down. So it might be handy to have something that just clips, you can get, rotates in place. I think you can get one that you can put like in the center of your chest. So that it's not off weighted on either the backpack yeah, straps. Yeah, you do a cotton carrier so does that with the chest in the middle, plate, and that way it can yeah. balance with whatever you've got in your backpack. Yeah, um, but if it was me, I would just put a tiny little wrist strap on it, and I would you know walk around whistling while I I bolo it over my head. Yeah, you would do that. Yeah, and that works great. <laughs> okay, that is it for tech support this week. That's. <laughs> All right. Never read the comments is where we're going to go next. This is the section where we make sure we always read the comments. We had a couple in here that were were teed up for Jordan, but because he's not with us today, we're going to postpone those till next time. Uh, So we've only got uh, three here. One of them is a reference to your Idaho video. And I kind of wanted to talk more about Idaho. Maybe we'll do that in the next podcast when Jordan's here because he's got a lot to to input in there as well. But from uh, TN Cow Daddy, which is... (laughs) I think that is it Tennessee, yeah. you think? TN, Tennessee Cow Daddy. <laughs> I just, I, I love it. Great name. Uh, great food shots from Candle in the Woods. On the podcast, I would like to hear more about your setup for these as well as any other food photography tips, especially how to get depth of field so that the entire dish is in focus. Did you stack or just use a smaller aperture? <laughs> Oh, so let's, this is an interesting thing. So first off, uh, Jaron helped me light that really nicely. We had uh, like an LED light, a Westcott L60B on one side, going through a nice soft panel, basically 90 degrees to the food left side. And then on the right side, we had a reflector just to kind of give some of that fill. So we have some directionality, but soft light. Honestly, 
I'm going to attribute the success of those photos because we got quite a bit of feedback on the shots, which is really nice. I'm going to attribute the success, uh, the success on those photos to a, the lighting was nice and I had help. Um, and B, uh, the folks at Candle of the Woods played the food beautifully, right? Like it's it's all that. I didn't really do much. There was no focus stacking. I did use a tighter aperture to get more depth of field, but I was still fairly selective on my depth of field. It wasn't like everything was in focus on the shots. And I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to food photography. I'm not a food photographer. This is maybe my second time shooting food. So we got lucky. We got lucky, and uh, and it's. I would say if anything can be get gleaned from that experience, you got to have the setup. The lighting's got to be good. The food's got to be beautiful. Uh, if you are shooting in a restaurant and you don't have artificial light, absolutely look for situations where you can utilize window light, uh, large amounts of light to really soften the food overall. And then, yeah, the food's got to be pretty. I mean, that I've, all the food that came out was just gorgeously plated. So it was all that. Chris was talking down his food photography chops leading into this like he was not like he's like i'm not a food photographer but i made we made him do it anyway and like uh i don't know we were sitting i remember we were sitting afterwards looking through his pictures uh up on that that where you got that astro shot of the bridge we were at that that airbnb in the middle of nowhere and you were just like flicking through them and i was losing my mind i was like you (laughs) absolutely slayed these nah i appreciate it they were really good and I'm just very proud of Chris because it just shows goes oh. to show that he's an excellent <laughs> photographer regardless of the subject. And that makes me so happy. Uh, Idaho, I mean, it's a, Idaho is a great experience because I got to do a lot of photography that I wouldn't normally do all together in one go. Like really, it was quite challenging. You know, we did a lot of flash portraits, did a lot of food. We did astral. We did landscapes. We did some wildlife. So that was that was neat. You were it basically using experience. one lens on the Nikon for a lot of this too, right? There was like, yeah, the 24 to 120 F4. It, it killed Such it. Such a great every, lens. Every situation such a great lens i, I was I, mean, I was really surprised how good that lens performed also the light was gorgeous in idaho the entire time like we, we got fog we got golden light we got mist like it was it's a beautiful state it's amazing anyways christy have you been to idaho <laughs> no no oh it's you gotta it. go Oh, rugged landscapes, beautiful light, the Palouse, everything. It's so beautiful. Oh, man. Oh, okay. All right. Go to Idaho, everybody. Uh, The last one here that I want to do today is uh, from Greg Pantelides. Pantelides? It's another YouTube comment. Pantelides? Chris, regarding your amazing digital TLR concept, which needs to happen, I have a question. Since only one lens can be in line with the sensor, how would we utilize the second lens? Would it rotate into position like a microscope? What are your thoughts on the sports finder? Would you introduce a small EVF to replace the experience? (laughs) I didn't actually think about it. I thought it was going to have just two sensors. Right. Yes. I, uh, so this needs to happen. Anyways, um, everybody seems excited except for one person in the comments who thinks it's stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I know, and I'm going to find you. Uh, I always envisioned this as two full frame sensors cropped square, um, which would be expensive. Absolutely. But they're like, I don't think anybody has any illusions that this camera would be affordable. Uh, but I always imagine two separate lenses, two separate sensors, fully sealed. A rotating element would be interesting. It would be bulky though, and it would have problems with maybe dust getting in and stuff. But I don't know, you know, or an interchangeable lens system might be cool too. But I always envisioned it with two separate sensors. As far as the sports finder, I'd leave it as a vintage sports finder. Why not? Just have your little square. Do it old school. It's digital. You're not wasting film. I would wouldn't necessarily replicate that with an EVF, but you would absolutely have your EVF waist level, you know, top uh, top down viewfinder, uh, and that would be fantastic. So, yeah, I don't know, lots Christy, of designs. Sky's he sky's really the wants limit. this. He wants he wants a digital a digital TLR. twin lens reflex, except without the reflex mirror. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's like his dream. Yeah. He's been talking about it now for uh, almost a month. Um, but, awesome. but I'm sure it's been the baking in his head much longer. Um, okay, but, <laughs> so that that's going to do it for us this week. And I do want to first say thank you to Christy for joining us. Thank you for taking Jordan's yes. spot and being very interesting and talented and amazing, as usual. Uh, I want to note everyone listening to the podcast, we are off next week. We'll see you on February 28th for the next podcast. So we apologize for anyone okay. who, who needs this every week, but you won't be getting us next week. Uh, we'll explain why maybe eventually. But uh, for now, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Chrissy, thanks again for coming. Thanks, thanks again to our again, sponsor, Christine. OM System. We appreciate them too. We like everyone here. Everyone gets appreciated. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.